All right, so let's get started. Um, so um, thank you for joining me for this talk on governance for software engineers. Um, so what are we going to do today? We're going to do uh, two things. Um, first of all, we're going to look at what is governance and try to um, demystify it, sorry, uh, demystify open source governance. Um, and secondly, in the second part, we're going to um, um, sort of um, offer a simple, practical, and proven approach to writing and maintaining project governance that is directly inspired from what we do when we code. So the idea here um, is to get people who are uh, familiar with who is software engineer engineers um, and kind of like stumble into leadership-ish uh, roles where they have to start thinking about project governance um, to um, essentially be able to apply the knowledge um, that they have uh, to write good quality, easily maintainable um, governance uh, documents um, and not spaghetti maintenance as we too often see and suffer from. Who am I? Uh, so my name is Toby Langel. I run a consulting firm um, called um, Unlock Open. I came to technology by being a jazz drummer in a band that needed a website. Uh, true story. Uh, no, for real. Um, it's, even, it's even funnier than that because it's my brother who taught me tech, and he is now a professional bass player. Uh, so, anyway, uh, I now run a consulting firm, um, and I've had plenty of roles um, in the, in the uh, governance aspects of um, open source software and standards. All right. <clears throat> so this is my second talk in this room, so my voice is already going down a bit, so I'm going to try to be careful to um, speak close to the mic and not too loud. Um, so let's start with uh, what is governance. And um, I, I just want to be clear here that we're going to be talking about governance of open source projects. Governance is like a super loaded term that's used to talk about corporate governance, about like a whole bunch of different governances. Um, we're not talking about any of those. This is project governance of open source projects. Um, so I'm going to offer um, sort of like a working definition of um, governance um, and going to kind of iterate over it a little bit by going through the concept of delegation of authority um, and um, also explaining how governance is bounded. Um, and I think it's a really important thing that we don't talk about enough. So here's my sort of working definition, right? So governance is the formalization of implicit norms and culture in order to scale collaboration. I'm going to put the slides up, by the way. You're, you're entirely welcome to take pictures, but you also can get the slides at the end. I, I know I like to do both, so I'm just saying. Um, so let's unpack this a little bit. And to unpack this, we're going to start by the end, scaling collaboration. Right? I think this is super important. Um, governance isn't something that you have to start to think about when you're running your own open source project right, by yourself. It doesn't make any sense. Right? So governance really comes as um, an issue with something to tackle as a project grows and as a project grows beyond a few people working together. Um, and you know, increasingly as more and more people start depending on the open source project. Right? Um, and so essentially the governance needs that you're going to have are a function of the size of the contributor pool, right? And the impact and reach of the project. If you have a really tiny project in terms of contributions, um, think about, um, um, I'm, I'm going to say, um, um, what is it called? SQLite, for example, like two or th I think three contributors. Um, but think about the impact of that project, like governance and thinking about governance. So it's critical. Um, implicit norms and culture, right? So governance is the formalization of implicit norms and culture um, in order to scale and collaboration. 
so the thing is like we all have norms and cultures right like i mean this is we all do this all the time uh, you have people that start um, working together and they have um, you know things that they believe in things that they care about like a vision for where the, the project is going um you know some um common understanding of a problem space etc right but these are entirely untold they're implicit right um you know you know these because they're part of like the norms of how you work together in your culture, right? It could be you do only asynchronous conversations. It could be you do a weekly meeting. Like these things are just sort of like they're there. They're obvious to you, but they're entirely not to outsiders, right? And so as you grow, you have to uncover those and make them, move them from implicitness to, exp to being explicit, right? That's a hard exercise, actually. <clears throat> and lastly, um, governance is about formalizing this, right? So it's not only about uncovering them, but it's about then expressing them in a way that fits into the bigger structure of essentially um, the industry, a foundation that you might be in, uh, the legal system, etc., right? So there is an aspect to governance that is about um, formalizing um, what you have um, made explicit of your norms and culture. Um, and that gets me to the second point, which is the idea of delegation of authority. So, so this is something that um, open source people, um, myself included, uh, don't think about very often and, and don't really like to think about, right? There is um, a form of unpleasantness um, to consider the thing that you started off doing because it's fun um, as uh, something that, um, you know, uh, fun and subversive and all of the values that a lot of folks in the open source ecosystem share um, to actually think about it in terms of how it fits in sort of like the so, you know, social norms and existing legal systems, right? But the thing is, it does, you know, starting from the licenses and the trademarks, whether you like it or not. And so I think just as, um, you know, talking about money in open source is important, um, I think talking about sort of like how author, author, authority is delegated from a legal system to an open source project and its maintainers, et cetera, is also important. It's important to actually understand and, and know how this stuff works. Um, so yeah, governance can be explicit or it can be implicit, right? You can have a board that like uh, owns the trademark to your project but it can be entirely implicit. You're working for a project, well, someone owns the trademark to it, you know, and you can't just run around and do whatever you want with that trademark, right? Um, and then governance can be really simple or it can be incredibly complex. Um, and, you know, for example, like OpenAI's uh, governance model was, uh, well, is incredibly complex, right? Um, you know, and, and as we'll see in a, in a, in a, in a few slides, a governance, by itself is not the only thing that matters, right? Um, sometimes uh, people can just decide that they no longer want to contribute to your project or use it um, and just leave, for example. Um, and that's something to consider too, right? We'll get back to this. Okay, so a few sort of examples of, you know, fairly, uh, you know, different structures of delegation of authority, right? Um, this is like a very basic um, open source um, project, right? Um, there is a legal system, and that legal system actually grants a number of rights to the owner of a trademark and of a, a copy um, and of copyright, right? Um, who usually is the founder of the project? Um, and you know, uh, so that's why I have a BDFL here, right? Um, and, you know, you're going to see some proto-governance going on here by having, uh, for example, sort of like a governance.md file in your repository. 
that sort of delegates some of this authority that is granted uh, to the owner of the project um, through literally trademark law um, to the core team, for example, to do a bunch of things, right? Um, and that can be further delegated to contributors, um, for example, through a contributing.md and a code of conduct, right? This is, this, I'm seeing lots of uh, surprised or uh, 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 concerned stares, right? But this is not how we think about this stuff, right? But this is literally what's going on. So uh, they're clear, no, there absolutely is ownership um, uh, and uh, delegation of power through the legal system to the owner of the trademarks and the copyrights to make decisions about the project. So this is a more complex project. This would be what a, a fairly large project in a dedicated foundation would look like, right? You'd have a legal entity, for example, a foundation um, that exists, that has authority being delegated to it through legislation, right? Um, itself sort of like, um, you know, through its bylaws, delegates authority to the board, the executive director, et cetera, et cetera. Um, who, through a charter, uh, uh, delegates authority on, you know, sort of like a subset of things, for example, a technical direction, um, to uh, project leadership, which itself, you know, through different governance documents, etc., uh, can uh, do the same, uh, you know, for example, have a COC team, um, have working groups that are chartered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And here's an even more complex but simplified example, right? Um, some foundations uh, it, themselves have um, projects, uh, uh, foundation projects under them. So not open source projects, but foundation projects. So for example, from a legal perspective, um, CNCF is not an independent foundation. It's a foundation project of the Linux Foundation, right? And, um, you know, such a, um, a project, a foundation project can itself have a number of projects and have, you know, a technical oversight committee, for example, for all of these different projects. Again, you see here sort of like this concept of delegation of power of authority um, uh, through different documents, um, essentially going down. But as I was alluding to earlier, this is not the only thing that matters, right? Um, essentially, governance exists in the space that's between the authority of people that can tell you what to do and the willingness of others to work with you, right? Um, if you have a project and you're being really silly with the governance of this project, people can just go away and fork it. I mean, we, we see this happen in a, you know, a fairly, um, you know, dr dramatic way on a regular basis, right? Uh, but I think it's a really important notion to think about, right? On one side, you have sort of like this um, formal um, um, structured delegation of authority um, um, to where you're making governance, right? And on the other, you have this informal uh, uh, structure of people just like deciding to work with you or not. Um, so yeah, one of the ways of thinking about governance is the organization of willing collaboration, right? This is the space in which governance happens. So again, if you're, if you're being unreasonable, people will just leave. Um, and so the other thing to you know, keep in mind is if, if you're, you remain subject to the authority of the entities that have power over you, um, and you can't substitute yourself to those entities, right? You can't make up governance that um, you know, is illegal, for example, right? Or you can't make up governance that like, gives you powers that are not granted to you by the board, for example. Um, and again, yeah, this, um, this power might be direct, so, you know, board, et cetera, 
or it might be indirect. And I was talking about people leaving, but it's, it can also be like, you know, members of a, of a foundation saying, well, if that's what you're doing with a project, well, we're no longer going to be members here, right? So these are things that you have to think about and take into account. All right. So <clears throat> sort of takeaways from these notions that we discussed so far. Um, governance is the organization of will and collaboration, right? It happens in that space between what people can tell you to do and whether people want to do something with you or not. It fits within an existing system, right? And so when you're formalizing something, you have to formalize it from that system. Like if authority to do X is given to you by the board, then that has to like you know, be spelled out somewhere and you can't delegate why to like a working group because you just don't have the authority to do that. Um, governance should be proportional to the project reach and complexity. Um, like essentially, like my biggest advice is write as little as possible all the time. Like you're, you're better off um, sort of like catching up with governance uh, than you are like preempting uh, problems. Uh, because like the real risk is like um, creating a really bureaucratic experience for everyone and making everything incredibly rigid and hard to change. Um, fourthly, and this is something I see a lot of when people start writing governance, is instead of um, just like spelling out what it is that they um, are already doing, they start um, thinking about all of the things that they would like to do, right? Or they start looking at what other um, projects do and essentially sort of, sort of like copy paste some of those practices, right? That's a really bad idea to do at the beginning, right? It might be something that you do as you need to solve problems that come up, right? But when you're um, in the process of making implicit um, norms and culture explicit, do that. Don't make things up at the same time. Um, and lastly, and I think that's super important, is convey intent, right? The process of turning uh, norms and culture into essentially rules is lossy. So um, you're going to lose a lot of uh, the reason for why things are done in a certain way, right? Um, and, and then um, when people are going to look at the rules, they're going to be like, okay, this rule is kind of weird. And they're going to be like, you start amending that rule because it's kind of weird. Uh, but they, if they don't have the context, if they don't have the intention behind the rule, um, then you're going to, you know, start to have like the, this kind of like patch patches and then like spaghetti of fixes that are um, not driven by an intention. So say what you're trying to achieve, right? That's kind of the, the goal was a rule, right? And say why it's important to you. So I'm, I'm going to offer an updated working definition, right? So governance is the formalization of implicit norms and culture in order to scale willing collaboration, right? That like accounts for the bounds. Or shorter, just the organization of willing collaboration. Also, I think if you, if you, take this as a definition of governance in an open source project, it's incredibly helpful to help scope what it is that you're doing and, and sort of bound it. All right, point two, um, writing and maintaining governance. So one of the things that you can do is to think of governance as code that has to be interpreted not by a computer, but by a human, right? So that kind of did that to, to my head when I, you know, that's kind of like uh, showed up, right? Um, and so essentially sort of like everything that you know about writing good quality code becomes even more relevant, right? I mean, we, we're all told, you know, write code for like uh, your colleagues or write code for you in six months or write code for you at like 3 a.m. on a Saturday dealing with like, uh, you know, uh, some huge sort of emergency on the, on the code base, right? Like we're told this all the time. 
Um, but, you know, we're kind of lucky in this code that we can just run it and if it works, it works. And we don't, you know, sometimes we're not, we don't, we're not as forced um, to, um, to think about the people reading it uh, as we are. So about governance, like we absolutely are, right? Like imagine that you're writing code that are going to be interpreted by lots of different human beings with like different contexts, different backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, um, that's really important to think about. All right, so in part two, we're gonna look at um, common issues, um, best coding practices as a solution, a simple framework to get you started, a few additional tips essentially around conflict and dealing with conflicts. Um, and, and then uh, we'll just wrap the whole thing up and um, answer any questions that you might have. Um, so common issues that you find in governance. Um, anyone who who's, has had to deal with governance of an open source, pro a sizable open source project or foundation, et cetera, um, essentially bumps into something that looks like this, right? Spaghetti code, um, uh, um, sort of like copy paste from different organizations. That's a very common thing that I, I've seen in my uh, consulting practice too. Is people copying a charter of something that looks really nice and that is successful, like the CNCF, right? And using this as bylaws for another organization. It, it doesn't work at all because they're not the same thing, right? Um, and, and so um, it's really important to understand that um, the, um, you know, your, like, Think about your organization and your specific norms and, and, and behaviors uh, uh, here and culture, um, not about what someone else is doing to avoid that kind of issue, right? So copy pasting. The, the other thing that you see a lot of is high um, coupling and low cohesion, right? So, you know, different parts of a governance that are tied together in really odd ways that make it really, really hard to um, separate things or to update something. Um, and then lack of structure, right? It's kind of like all over the place and it's really confusing to uh, figure out like, uh, you know, the, um, the sort of um, 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 authority delegation that I was talking about before is often extremely hard to perceive when you look at governance of a, of a foundation, for example, right? And that's an example, like that's due to the lack of structure. Um, so yeah, this leads to essentially a maintenance nightmare um, hard to modify and update. I mean, the exact same thing that you see in code, right? Um, difficult to understand the governance and for what. Like, where do I have to look for what? Right? How do I know this? Um, and like the real big risk and something that I also see a lot is you start to have two realities, right? The paper governance, like what is supposed to be to happen, right? And then the common practices that everyone have been practicing, right? And those two things kind of like start to diverge, right? And that makes it actually even worse than not being explicit about things, right? You have like two realities. On those for the, you know, the reality for the inside group and then this other paper reality for the outside group. All right, so good coding practices as a solution. Right? Literally the same coding practices that work well for code work well for governance, right? Good architecture, low coupling, high cohesion, separation of concerns, don't repeat yourself, et cetera, et cetera. Like I had a lot more, but then they wouldn't fit on the page, uh, like literally. Uh, so, you know, um, come to this with the same mindset. Um, and so I promised a simple framework to get you started. And, and so this is it. It's actually it, very, very basic. The idea is you have five kinds of documents at most. Um, three of them are really where the governance happens. And then the two, the guidelines, the documentation is sort of adjacent, right? Um, charters are about who, right? Who's going to be doing what, right? Um, and so this is where you do delegation of authority. You charter uh, like a, you know, a technical steering committee will charter a working group, right? There is delegation of responsibility and maybe power, right? Um, in policy documents, you put high level goals, what it is that you're trying to achieve, right? And you get bonus points in there 
if you say why, right? If you give the intention behind uh, the policy. And then in process, you put implementation of the policies, right? So three very distinct things, documents that cover the who, the what, and the how. Then when you have a whole bunch of policies and a whole bunch of process, and there is a task that everyone has to do on a regular basis, like onboard a new project in a foundation, for example, uh, you're not going to expect someone that joins in to like know all of your stuff, right? So for these kind of like cross-cutting, high-level things, you can do guidelines, right? Guidelines are not policy or process in the sense that uh, this is not where the rules are written, right? Guidelines are kind of like, um, um, you know, a, a short best practices of, it's like a TLDR, right? Of like, what are the policies and, and, and processes that you need to follow to do X? And then in documentation, you put everything else. So if you look at this um, uh, as a coding equivalent, I hope this is going to help make it a little more clear. Um, so the charter is the one that is the hardest to um, think about in terms of code, right? But it's kind of the orchestration layer of how things are done, right? So it could be a main function. It could, you could think of it as a config file, um, as a framework that structures sort of like, uh, you know, how the, the whole uh, organization, the whole governance is structured. Um, think of policy as type definitions, interfaces, API, header files in, in, in C, right? This is where you give like the high level direction but no code. The implementation is not there, right? And then process, this is where the code happens, right? And then, I don't know if you're familiar with the facade design pattern or high-level APIs. Um, this is what a guideline is, right? So a high-level high API, um, for example, an example is on the web, uh, you now have a bunch of APIs to essentially stream on the pixels coming from the camera and, the, um, um, and be able to print them on screen and do a whole bunch of things with this, right? And that's super useful if you want to do some like very involved, um, um, you know, um, so for example, like video conference and, and do like uh, AI shifting, uh, you know, with back backgrounds and stuff like this, right? But if you just want to take a picture, you don't really want to deal with like low level APIs and like, you know, streaming stuff from a camera, et cetera, right? You just want like a very simple API to say, oh, I just want to take a picture. So this is exactly what a guideline does. This is like a facet interface, right? Um, it, it's, you know, a high level thing to do like, uh, you know, it's 20%. Uh, to do what 80% of people actually want to use, right? And then just documentation is documentation. Um, from an um, ownership perspective, that's a really important thing when, you, when you're uh, doing governance, right? Who owns what files? Well, fairly simple. Charter is owned, and charter and policy is owned by the delegating authority, right? So for example, a technical steering committee delegating work to a working group like they would own um, the charter and policy doesn't mean that others can't make pull requests, et cetera, right? But the ownership is um, with the delegating authority. And process, you want to move close to the people actually doing the work. And so that's owned by the implementers. And then guidelines and documentation is going to depend on the case, on the cases. Uh, so how does this work in practice? I'm going to give you a few examples, right? Um, so imagine that you have, um, you want to, you're writing a policy about specific goals that you have, right? That's the what. Um, and, you know, again, bonus points if you're actually explaining why those goals matter to the organization. You're going to charter a group to implement that policy. And that group itself is going to implement that policy through a process that it controls. For example, moderation policy for GitHub, right? Uh, 
You write a policy about goals that you have in your community for moderation in general, not specifically for GitHub, right? I don't know what it could be, like you want people to behave properly, don't use sexist language, et cetera, et cetera, right? You explain why this matters to you. I think this is important, right? Like, you know, it's, moderation policies are important because if not, like, um, you know, it scares a whole bunch of people that we care about away, right? Or it makes it for, you know, whatever it is, whatever are the reasons that are driving that policy on your end. Then you charter a GitHub moderation group to implement that policy, which is high level, right? Specifically for GitHub, right? What does it mean What uh, you know, uh, in the process? Like, you know, who's going to be looking at the issues? Uh, what are you gonna do if there's spam that shows up? What are you gonna do if someone uses sexist language in a comment, right? That's process, it is not policy. So what's really nice about working that way is now if you wanna have something for Discord, right? You're not dealing with, well, you know, the code of conduct that we have isn't really a good fit for um, Discord because things are different there, right? Or, you know, like whatever we have isn't a good fit because, um, well, obviously Discord is different than GitHub, right? Um, so yeah, really the benefit here is you can have one policy and then multiple specific processes that are relevant to the specific cases. Second example, right? As a group, you write a policy about specific goals that you want to achieve, the what, right? And someone with domain expertise in that group just goes off and writes a process for it. That makes a ton of sense. It's a great separation of work, right? You're a group of people, you all care about one thing, someone's really good at this thing, right? And they kind of, they're better off implementing it, like writing how to implement it than like having everyone think about this, including a bunch of people that have opinions that are valid, but also don't necessarily have the domain ex expertise to be able to do that. An example, bug triaging, right? So let's say that the core team agrees that bug triaging is important and needs to improve, right? They run a policy about how they wanna handle this. Um, uh, you know, and the policy says, well, every, you know, every bug must be triaged and assigned to an owner promptly. So little asterisk here, um, it's, um, uh, valuable to um, um, think about the fact that you know what you put in policy and what you put in process is going to be uh, it's going to depend on the case, right? There's you have leeway and flexibility here, right? You could say in the policy promptly, right, or you could say in less than forty eight hours, right? Um, when to use what? is going to depend on a bunch of, on the context, on what you're talking about, like um, how, uh, how much autonomy does the, you know, triaging group has, et cetera, right? Uh, and then Annie, as an example, who does most of triaging, like goes off, right? And she writes the process, explains like what uh, uh, GitHub uh, issue is gonna be used, what label, blah, 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 right? So you don't have eight people sort of, um, um, bike shedding like the color of like the label of a GitHub issue um, at the, you know, thinking at the policy level. And the benefit of this, of course, is when you decide to charter a dedicated a triaging team down the road, right, you already have a split thing. You already have the policy that can stay with the technical steering committee um, and um, um, the process that can be, uh, you know, uh, given to that, uh, to that group um, uh, to manage. Um, third example, this is the guidelines, right? Um, so, um, for example, um, there is a number of complex policies and processes to manage IP, right? Um, this is extremely confusing to new projects who don't know where to start or what's expected from them. You write a guideline for that, right? Um, the guideline outlines like the key requirements and shows best practices. It doesn't replace existing policies or processes, right? It just like outlines the ones that matter for that specific task, um, and also kind of drives best practices. Again, it's the 2080 uh, rule, right? Uh, you wanna make something that uh, is 20% of all of the other policies combined, that works for the 80% of uh, use cases. So why is this good as a framework? <clears throat> 
Well, you know, you have leadership that, divide, that defines high-level goals, and then implementation of those goals um, is with the people who are actually implementing it and who are empowered to do so, right? It's like, this is like shift left, right? Um, it also um, creates like a natural structure for conversations um, between the different groups, right? Um, uh, you know, for example, you, you can talk about like, you know, is the implementation actually making, uh, like fulfilling our goals, right? This is an easy sort of like structured conversation to have. Our, you know, our policy things that we cared about, like non-manageable, right? Like it's actually not possible to implement. The, the conversations are structured and happen in like in, in a place that's clear and that's in, incredibly helpful. It's easier to work around uh, disagreements, right? Um, when you know whether you're disagreeing about like the policy, the, the, the goals, the va your values and goals, right? Or about how to implement it. Like that makes it way easier to move conversations forward. And you might be able to entirely agree about goals and disagree about processes, um, but still make progress as a result, right? And then decide maybe like to leave the process to like a group that would be chartered to do that. Um, yeah, again, it uh, helps um, focus conversations. You know whether you're discussing the what or the how. Helps avoid micromanagement and creates autonomy. Um, you know, it's flexible, maintainable, simple. A few additional tips. Um, this is kind of like a little um, disconnected from the rest of the conversation. Um, but I think those are really important things that I've seen um, happen quite a lot. Um, it's fairly easy to fall in the trap of, um, of uh, managing conflict or avoiding hard conversations by writing governance. Don't do this. Like from the bottom of my heart, don't do this. Uh, actually solve the, solve the underlying problems, right? Don't don't like work your way around not having difficult conversations using governance. It's like it really leads to a pile of governance that's complex um, 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 and, and unpleasant to, to deal with. And you still have the underlying issues um, and, and then actually manage conflicts one on one. Um, I know we love to do a whole bunch of things on the open, but like managing conflicts in, in person over a call, uh, not over chat. Um, um, is actually like something that's really important. All right, um, so wrapping this up, um, you know, again, the definition that I offered, governance is the formalization of implicit norms and culture in order to scale willing collaboration. Um, governance is structured around authority delegation. That is true, whether we like it or not. Um, governance is code that has to be interpreted by humans. So essentially, all of the pra best practices you know about code are even more valid here. Um, adopting coding best practices through the simple framework um, uh, helps um, write flexible and maintain ma maintainable sorry, governance. Um, and then lastly, like um, go try this um, uh, you know, in, in your own projects and reach out and tell me how it goes or reach out if you uh, have questions or want help implementing this um, because I'd love to have feedback on this. It, I have seen it work well um, for me. Um, I would love to have input from others also using this. And that's it. Questions? Thank you.